How's everybody doing? All right. There are prizes. Okay, so it's all about participation. <laughs> Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to get a chance to, to tell you some of my experiences. Uh, a little bit about in moments, but hopefully more uh, about some of the lessons that I've learned and uh, things that, that I've gone through. Uh, first off, I think it is. Let's just hang on. Turn me up. Test. Okay, better. Thank you. Okay. Hmm, this isn't working anymore. That's a problem. I'll leave it with that. So a um, little bit about a moment. Uh, we're in the customer experience business. Uh, it started off as a small space where we were collecting feedback from brands to tell them you know, what they're doing right and doing wrong. And suddenly it's become, how does a brand make a decision and steer their business relative to their customer? So it's been an ever-expanding business for us. Uh, we work with a, a lot of different businesses, uh, about 500 different you know, global brands right now. About 380 employees uh, with offices and a lot of fun places. They're always fun to visit and, and keep expanding. Uh, we gather insight from a ton of different uh, countries. It's kind of crazy. I think I know it's over 100 plus countries now and uh, about 90 plus languages. A uh, couple things just to highlight. I, I like this slide just because it shows some of our other BYU friends up here. Uh, Qualtrics, yes, we beat them in this test. And uh, Merits, I don't know what happened there. We lost our. Sorry about that. Uh, but this was uh, done by Forrester Wave and uh, evaluating uh, top providers of voice of the customer, customer experience programs. Uh, we're really proud of what we've done. We're competing with companies uh, up there. If you look at Medallia, they raised uh, over 300 million. Uh, Qualtrics, same kind of things. Uh, we're a bootstrap company. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means to be a bootstrap company versus a VC funded company. Uh, here's just a quick little look of where we've collected data from. Uh, we've collected data from a lot of places. Uh, to size this, um, last year we collected about 150 million customer reviews. Everybody's heard of Yelp, right? Yelp in their lifetime, in about 18 years, has collected about 120 million reviews. We collected more last year than they have in their lifetime. So we collect a lot of experiences from cu customers. Imagine if you were a CEO and you could go through and read 10,000 customer reviews every day know exactly what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, what product improvements customers are requesting, what failures they're experiencing, and have that all delivered in real time to the right people that can solve the problem. And that's what a moment does. Here's some of the brands we do this for. And they're Fortune 500, Fortune 100 clients. It's great. We work with some wonderful brands to go through and help them improve. And that's the thing I'm noticing is the pace of change. Does anybody know how long the average app lasts on a phone now, from install to deletion? This is the average. Everybody know? Yeah. Close. <laughs> That's even faster. I thought it last week, last year it was about two weeks. This year it moved up to 72 hours, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. So the pace of change and the rate at which we have to adapt and adjust to the changing opinions of our customer base forces the, the focus on what customers are saying. Right? So if you think about customer experience, it's about every single touch point. So there's your internal customers, those are your employees and your partners, and then your external customers, and of course the ones who are paying your money as well. But it's every single one of those magic moments, right? You want to be able to go through and listen to that, and listen in a positive, proactive way. So we have products called like Active Listening, which is a text analytics product that as a person is typing out their thoughts, we'll ask them additional follow-up questions. Because if they say, tell us about your experience, and they say, well, it was great, we'll say, well, what well, was great? <laughs> we kind of keep probing them and, and egging them along to give us more information. We have products that will go through and, like I said, read those 10,000 comments and come in every day and automatically surface up insights and tell you when there are fundamental shifts in your business model, like a breakdown in security or a problem that occurred because of a broken piece of equipment. We can go through an alert automatically on that. We do financial analysis coupled with, of course, the customer experience data. So we can go through and predict when customers are going to churn and figure out how to save them before they leave you. And of course, various different types of big data analysis we do regarding core business questions and metrics that people are asking. 
So, a little bit about my experience. My first job out of school uh, was with a company called Stern and Wentworth, financial software company. Uh, I was employee 15. Uh, they were making like $2 million a year and had a chance to work with them, build that business up. I ended up on the executive team. After about eight years, we sold the business off. It was a wonderful first time experience for a person to be able to participate and see a business grow. Second business I was involved with was uh, Blue Step. This was a uh, dot com. Started in 1999. I was hired as a CTO. Uh, well, I think I was employee four. And it was VC funded. We went and raised $20 million and we effectively spent all $20 million. Well done. And we went out of business. <laughs> that was like one of those terrible experiences, right? Uh, to go through and do that. Uh, and I'll tell you a little, I'll tell you some. There are differences between a bootstrap company and a VC company, as you're aware. Uh, and I'd like to get into some of the important pieces there. Uh, next one, uh, in moment, bootstrap. Uh, we started in moment in 2002, right after the dot com completely blew up. In 2002, in Utah, there was $5 million of investment money. Total. That's across all companies in the state of Utah. Does anyone know how much was invested in Utah this last year? Scott, you have any idea? Investment in Utah? This is the last 12 months. Yeah? 300 million? It was more, I think it was close to a billion dollars. Kind of just to compare the numbers, 5 million in 2002, it was just shy of a billion, this is the numbers I was looking at. Kind of amazing. Think about the change there, right? So. There was no way you were going to get funding for anything in 2002. I read an article that when we were closing up a blue step that said there were 500 software and technology companies that closed their doors that quarter that we went out of business. So imagine going through and trying to apply for a CTO position. By the way, there's just one of those at every company. <laughs> there's 500 out on the street, and you're all applying for that. Well, there aren't any jobs. This is not being funded. So you basically have to kick someone out of a job there. That's what I was looking at going, what am I going to do? And that's when I started looking around and talking to people and found some opportunities. And maybe to tell you a little bit, and Scott was just talking about a new company I just started up. It's kind of in stealth mode right now. Uh, but it's a bootstrap company, and we're currently going through and, and working on it right now. Actually, our first employee is down here on the front row. Yeah, there he is. My son. <laughs> He's working for it. But it's kind of fun. I asked him, and I said, do you want to be paid? Or do you want uh, options in the company? And he said, I want options. I'm going to talk about what that means to be an employee entrepreneur. So we think about VC versus bootstrap. There are different kinds of pressure with these types of companies, different kinds of cultures, different kinds of ownership, and different kinds of control. They just, they just are. Now, the reality is some of these companies can only be started with one mode or another. If you have such a new idea and such a new market, chances are you're not going to get money for it. Because people are like, that's not proven. I don't believe in your market size or valuation. You, you know, I don't believe it. You're not going to get money for it. The other side of the equation is, say, for example, you are a pharmaceutical, you know, you're building a new pharmaceutical drug, and you're a startup company. Anybody know how long it takes a drug to get through the FDA approval process? <laughs> yeah. It's like eight to ten years. So that's a long time to bootstrap. So. I, I'm actually invested in a, a pharmaceutical business right now, and they did it through angel money, basically from doctors. They said, we're not going to use VC, we're going to go for doctors instead of believing this. So suffice to say, I'm, I'm heavily biased towards bootstrap, because I believe that your efforts should reward you, not somebody else. OK, so the VC company, the parable of the business executive. Could I have a volunteer, someone to come up here with me? Come on up. What's your name? Taylor. Taylor. How you doing? Good. Okay. Hard worker? I think so. Think so, or you are? I get better. Okay, good. I just want to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about. I need you to kind of imagine some things with me, okay? We're up on this hillside, looking up at a giant mansion on the hill. There's an attached barn that has like every single toy you've ever imagined in it. The golf course is off to the side. You got it there? Yeah. And it's this incredible place. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to make sacrifices. I need you to give 110% of yourself. I need you to work 60, 70, 80 hour weeks. And someday, 
all of that will be mine. Okay, go ahead and take a seat. Okay. <laughs> Maybe let me do this on Friday. We'll get us up. Come here. All right. Get your chosky. Okay. So the idea is sometimes we work hard, but in the process of doing that, we end up giving our company away and someone else makes money off of us. And that's not necessarily a bad thing unless we lose ourselves along the way. Um, about four years ago, um, I bought a company that was a direct competitor of ours. Good, successful business, people I liked. They've done some great things and we see them in almost every deal we go into. It was kind of a good respect thing. I said, you know what, they're good people. I like what they're doing. We, we talked every now and then about possibly putting the two companies together and finally we went and did it. We went and acquired them, uh, full acquisition, and brought them into our fold. And that's when I found out some of the sad stories. So we bought these guys for like 40 million bucks. Founder had been in about 12 years. How much money do you think the founder made? Don't say anything. Anybody know? Take a guess. One million. Hundred thousand. Why hundred thousand? It's kind of depressing, actually. <laughs> I dream bigger than that. I'd say like thirty million. What should the founder make? Spent twelve years of their life, a lot of sacrifice. What would be fair? At least ten. Thank you. Oh, this person actually ended up making around one hundred fifty thousand. So your hundred thousand dollar guess wasn't that far off. But why'd they end up at one hundred fifty thousand dollars after all that? BC money, yeah. Four rounds, by the way. But the first round being the worst, right? Coming in and taking like 40% of the business right from the get-go. And then the subsequent rounds just kind of ate away at it until after preps and everything else kicked in, there wasn't any money left for them. I didn't know that. I was just bidding the way I was supposed to. I was trying to get the best deal for the best price. Sorry, I don't know what's going on there. Hey, that's my family. Okay. We're getting that back up. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so let's get on the next piece here. So the bootstrap company. Uh, for us, this meant the table in the break room was my mother-in-law's. It was a nice group. We also signed our first contract around it. None of the chairs in the conference room matched, uh, let alone the office. Uh, none of the desks matched, and for that matter, most of them were left there by the last tenant, which was so true. And running out of money is just a matter of doing business. Uh, literally, when we started up in moments, there were office space everywhere. People were going out of business left and right. And uh, the landlord in our building would call us and say, hey, uh, the people up on the third floor just left. You can go take anything you want there. So we'd go up and get the chairs and desks and stuff, you know, and haul them back down. And then like on the fourth floor, these people like were a lotion company and we had like lotion for like ever. I have some if you want. It's <laughs> like a lot of lotion. <laughs> we gave lotion, I, and by the way, don't ever re-gift. Because we re-gifted like the lotion and everybody knew where it came from and it was like, that wasn't cool. It's exactly, it's off to ask. <laughs> it was like totally not fair. So here's some questions. When you go out and raise money, let's say for example you just take a little bit of it. And they're in charge of the cash flow to you and feeding that money to you. Who's really in charge of your business? Even though you own the majority of it, right? They are. It becomes difficult. So you just have to be careful when you take that early money because there's some things you have to realize is that we as entrepreneurs, we always believe we're going to make that jump the first time. <laughs> the reality is that is exactly what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Because the first time, it just doesn't work. And you know, the wild thing is, here, let's just see if we can make it. <laughs> Average, guess how many times we as entrepreneurs get to do that before we make it? It's like three times. It sucks. It hurts every time. I'm going to make it this time. I'm going to make it. It's not making it. And, and that's the thing you have to remember is that you've got to get it figured out before you go get money. Because the first time you walk in to get money, I mean, especially now, there's so much money out there, isn't there, Scott? There's money flowing everywhere, and people like walking up to you, hey, I can put money in your thing, and you're like, no, I don't think so. 
and no people will come through and, and boy they, they treat you so well the first time you come in they talk like this The problem is, you're going to crash, and you're going to have to come back for money. You're going to crash, and you're going to have to come back for money, and you're going to crash again. You're going to have to come back for money once you get hooked on it. Because you get this thing called payroll, and it's kind of like required for business, right? And I don't want to say you don't want to do that, but just remember, you're going to crash again. And the next time you show up for money, they know you need it. They sound like this. The secret of not complete. When I left you, I was about to learn. Now, you are so screwed. <laughs> they're gonna take your company from you. This is gonna happen. And it's just frustrating, right? You're like, hey, you know my idea, you believe in it, and they're like, you know, I'm investing in you. And they say all the right things, it feels right, but then they're like taking your company and you're like in this situation. It's hurt so bad. Uh, we'd raised some money, about 12% of our company, uh, for some angel money. And we were down to the final few, uh, we, had, we had two more payments coming to us. And we had a contract come in with great clicks. Hadn't yet signed, but it was like a million dollars. It was gonna make the business. And um, the VCs called up and said, these angels called up and said, we're not gonna send you the next payment because you missed your target. And I'm like, you kidding me? We're like, everything's going great, and now you're gonna say you're not gonna send payment. And they said, well, we'll do it, but we're gonna renegotiate terms and double the equity that we took. So they want to go from 12.5% to 25% for the remaining two payments. And we're like, this is insane. So there were 10 of us. We sat down with each person individually and said, what do you want to do? Do you want to give up another you know, double the amount of equity to get the new, next two payments? Basically, it's two more paychecks. Okay, to say that a lot. Or, what do you want to do? And every single person said, no, I don't want to do that. We've already been down that road. A bunch of us have already done it. Before. So we're going to go with that one. And the next month, there in July, great folks came on, and they said, we're signing. And the problem was they didn't deploy until February. So county rules, we couldn't you know, actually receive any money until then. So everybody went without pay for about six, seven, eight months. And the individuals ended up with that money and ownership instead of those angels. We actually bought all those angels. It's one thing that's kind of weird, when you're in the situation like we were right at that moment, and they control the cash flow, it doesn't matter what their ownership is, they control whether you're going to be able to pay your employees or not. It's kind of a crazy power that they're in charge of the business now. And they'll tell you to do things, like hire certain people. We were told to hire this person as head of sales, which I just did not get along with at all. And I was like, are you kidding me? I have to hire this person that I don't agree with. Yes, if you want to get the next payment, you have to hire them. That's the kind of kind of control that we have. So like Ron Felter, he was required to hire an office linebacker. When we asked Reebok to send us Terry Tank, some people thought we were crazy. But I'm a firm believer in paradigm breaking, outside the box thinking. Hey, buddy. It looks fun, but they're really awful to have around. <laughs> An office linebacker, and that's what you get. You get these kind of, I don't want to say a nanny, but you get these people you're required to hire, and they may not fit the culture of your company. They may not fit where you want to take them. And suddenly you have this whole outside control thing going on. Okay. Question for you. What did you want to be when you grew up? You're still growing up, but think about that. Think about what you wanted to be when you grew up. When I grew up, I want to file all day. I want to claw my way up to middle management. Be replaced in I want to be a yes man. Yes woman. Yes sir. Coming sir. Anything for a raise, sir. When I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be underappreciated. He paid less for doing the same job. I want 
sometimes blown up by dress. I love that. Um, so I'm sure that's what all of us wanted to be when we grew up. I'm going to claw my way up and middle man. Love that kid. <laughs> so true. And, and these are some of the realities you realize you start taking a job in the real world. You're like, wow, that's not like being a fireman, you know, <laughs> or an astronaut or some of the things we dreamed of when we wanted to be kids. And that's one thing I realized real quick is the world's full of, of different groups of people that have succeeded in different ways. And I kind of came up with, I, I, I try to come up with models for myself to try to understand the world a little bit. And this first one here I call King Swords and Sirs. And, and this first group I, I call kings or queens, if you will. These are people through a little effort of their own are successful. But they're either born into it or fall into it. And all of us have a friend that's a king or a queen. And you're just like, really? How did you end up with all this money? <laughs> and that's okay. The reason I call them kings or queens is because the laws of the land don't apply to them. So get them out of your mind. Don't worry about the pride or envy or anything else in there. Just put them in their own class and say, that's where the kings and queens are. I, I'm, I'm not one of them, so put them off to the side. The next group is the serfs. These are just people working for the man. The key thing here I want you to take away is they don't know the value they create, therefore they don't get the pay they deserve. Okay? But if I can teach you anything in this class, that's the most important thing you can share with me. Know the value that you create. It's the only way you're going to get the pay you deserve. Sorry. <laughs> it's always multimedia. Okay. It was two times last time. I don't know why. Okay. Oops. But I go on file all day. Okay. Then the last category here is what I call lords. And these are people who take a personal risk. Okay? You're taking risks. You're not going to take the easy way. They sacrifice pay today for ownership tomorrow. They're entrepreneurs. You can be an entrepreneur at an existing company right now. I call it the employee entrepreneur. And that's what those people I was telling you about at, at the early days of Moment. They chose to go through and do that. We, we've had 20 employees pay off their mortgages. Or and that's a neat way to go through and say of success. And those early people, they all end up with some great takeaways from the company and something they're extremely proud of. When I get a note from someone that says, I just paid off my mortgage or I just paid off my, my debts, it's really cool for me to be able to go through and, and hear those things. There's some companies around here that don't necessarily share it the same way. And I think it's important for you to go in with your eyes open to see. If you're going to go in and say, is there an opportunity for me to be an employee entrepreneur or not? Some places just pay well, and that's fine too. All good takeaways. Okay, so let's think about this now. How do we change our stars? Show this little clip. My lords, my ladies. A match is three bucks. Two points for break on health. And three points for bearing the light to the ground. And you men die, Jeff. Accidents happen. Alright, 
So changing our stars, right? Going from being a surf. I'm, I'm a surf. I like to weld. I do. <laughs> I'm terrible at it. Right, Josh? He's terrible at it. And how do we go and do that? We do it by taking chances, by taking risks. Just not taking a job, per se, but taking those risks. So let's talk about the employee entrepreneur a little bit. First thing you need to do when you go into a business, evaluate it like it's a startup. It can be old. Uh, the first company I went and worked at, Sir and Wentworth, these guys were 12 years old and had only $2 million in revenue. Why did I join them? Because I evaluated the opportunity they had there. I came in, I took over their whole product line, and I focused on building out that business. Went through and grew it up and sold it off. It was nice. It was a great experience. Look at the fit. You need to go through and evaluate what you are good at. I'll show you a little matrix on that. You need to know where your value is. If your value is not lined up with what you're working at, your job position, it's very difficult to be successful. It's good to evaluate that. And next, ask the question, can you be a key employee? Has anyone heard of key man insurance? Anyone heard of that? Sometimes you hear people like a pro player getting their arm or leg insured. You ever heard of those? Key man insurance is kind of the same thing. The idea is that this person is so valuable that they have insurance taken out on them in case that doesn't impact the business. I'll talk a little bit about that. All right, first, evaluating fit. So to me, there are three key questions that you need to go through and have at least two of them work for you for it to be a good job. The first is, what do you like doing? The next, what are you good at? And the last one, what are people willing to pay you for? What I find interesting is how many of us haven't really thought this through. I, I hadn't even thought through it all. And uh, this for me was a, a eye opener as I kind of started evaluating what I wanted to do in my career. So let's put it into a matrix here and go through each of these questions. So let's say, for example, the first one, it's something that you really like, but you're not necessarily good at it and no one's going to pay you a lot of money. What's that one? That is, that's a hobby. See starving artist. Okay. Let's say, for example, the next one here is something that you're good at, but you don't necessarily like it, and no one's going to pay you a lot of money for it. What's that? It's a government job, any other things? Job? Yeah, it's your standard kind of job, right? You're a surf. Welcome to 99% of the population. You get paid the going rate. How many of you guys want to be paid the going rate? You want to be paid that? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, that's the reason you're here, right? You're here to change the rules in your favor. So let's say, for example, you're good at it. People want to pay you a lot of money. What is that? It's a good job. You're right. That's exactly what it is. Thank you for the good job. And most people don't find this. Find a good job. Let you bend the rules. That's why you go to college in the first place, is to try to get above the going rate get paid your value, right? Okay, let's say for example, it's something that you like and you're good at, but people won't necessarily pay you a lot of money. What is this? This is a teacher. Scott, you get paid a lot of money doing this? He doesn't get paid. I, don't, I think he actually pays for the privilege. <laughs> yeah, but we do it for different reasons. Again, if you have two of these, it's a good job, in my opinion. You gotta get two checks to be able to do this. I have a lot of friends that they love what they do, and they're really good at it. And they're okay with the other part. Money, they don't chase money, because there's no happiness there necessarily. So make sure we're not chasing the wrong thing. It's an important thing for us in the gospel, remember. All right, let's say for example, uh, you don't like your job, you're not good at it, and no one's gonna pay a lot of money for it. What's that one? That, that is the government job. <laughs> That's the government job, there it is. Hang on, hang on. Although, this changed in 2009 when we started paying government employees more, so it's actually a weird category. I don't really know if I understand this one. <laughs> and the idea is to get to this last one, right? As entrepreneurs, what we want to do is be able to have all the checks. Something that we love, something we're good at, and something that is rewarded commiserate to the value we're creating. That's the important thing. I, I, it wasn't that long in my first job where I thought, I don't like the idea that I'm not getting paid for what I'm creating. And when I started at Stern Wentworth, the company made $2 million. Just a few years later, we're making $20 million. And it was $18 million that came from the products I'd created. And I was like, you know, I'd like to be compensated for that. And luckily enough, I got some ownership in that company. But that doesn't always happen. Okay. 
Next question is regarding value. This is getting and talking about your core skills versus your unrelated skills. This is an important one, because when we take a job, sometimes we're hired because of a skill set and we get stuck in there, and it ends up kind of looking like this. You've got, hey, if I'm doing my core skill, I can create great ROI for the business. And the more ROI I create for the business, the more pay I can get, right? Think of a good salesperson. They get paid on commission, they're gonna make a lot of money. But what happens if your job has these unrelated skills that you're also supposed to do, and you're not really that good at it, and you don't really care for it? Maybe this is 60% of your job and only 40% of your job's on your core skill. It's not a good fit, right? Best to think that through before you get stuck in that situation. Most people I talk to are not happy with their job just because of this kind of alignment problem. Instead, you want to go through and look at what we call sister skills. These are skills that are closely aligned with your core one and closely aligned with the value of the company. You get any value what's important to the business, how you can help out. We had a real good discussion of this over the summer talking about sister skills and how we can help people out. Okay, the next one I'm going to talk with her is about being a key employee. I call these uh, my four steps of keyness, if you will, and I talk with them about employees as you bring them on. And the idea is, again, thinking of key man insurance. I'm going to lose it again. Right? There we go. Okay. But I remember I, I had my first raise, and I got a cola. Anybody know what a cola is? Cost of living adjustment. <laughs> Basically, it's a really small raise. <laughs> and I, I, I was sitting there looking at, at uh, the president of the company, which he's actually here as a founder, so I won't mention his name. <laughs> and, and I said, I go, what do I have to do to get more than just a cola? And he goes, well, you just need to, to show me why you're key. And I kind of went away and started thinking about what it means to be key, in this case, a key man someone that they'd be willing to take insurance out against the value of the company. So they're worried about me disappearing. So the first step here is what I call learn something new of value that no one else in the company knows. And now you're key by an act of scarcity. I, I sometimes refer to this as the golem stage because you like, have that one precious thing and you're like, precious, and you don't want to let go of it. And, and it's important to get to stage one, to step one, if you will, and you know, sometimes in a small company, that's just that you happen to be the person who knows how to work the printer. I mean, it's silly, right? And you don't want to be the person that gets called on to always fix the printer. That's like a nightmare. But figure out what that is and get it. And then get another one, then get another one. But quickly, as soon as you learn that first step, you want to go through and teach it to somebody else. Now you become more important in the business because you're a duplicator of knowledge. This is the single biggest problem businesses have is growing their knowledge. It's why businesses don't scale well. So if you can get in and show that you're valuable because you're a trainer, you're that much more important to the business. Step three, think outside the box. Create something of value to the company's top line. Too many times, employees just think of their job. This is what I do. You've, you've been given your tasks and you do it. No, don't just think that way. Think about how you can help the business. Um, we have this concept I call 5X where any employee can come up with an idea that gets built into a product. And the idea is to have it be a 5X idea. It means five times more valuable than something else that's going on. So we don't want just any idea thrown up against the wall. We want ones that have been proven and thought through and pushed, just like you guys are doing with the big presentation you just had. So now, in step three, you're an innovator because you're not just doing your job. You're thinking how to change the business. Step four is to teach others to do this, to get them out of the box. And now you're key because you're a leader. So those are the four steps of keyness. Let's talk about the last little piece here. Uh, leadership and values. Um, my job versus my company. This seems like a, a straightforward one, but if you're getting ready to join a business and evaluate it, listen to the way the people talk about the business. People that love where they work own it. They say, this is my company. They have the tattoo on their arm or whatever way you want to envision that, right? People that just have a job just say that. Well, my job is the following. And listen for that kind of language. It really will give you a big tell to you when you're doing an interview. Listen to the way they talk about it. Showing with gold. Uh, let me tell you a small little parable. You're on a boat about a half mile from shore. And there are 90 pounds of gold on this boat. 
and the boat sinking. What are the chances you can swim with 90 pounds of gold a half mile? You're probably going to die trying, right? You're going to die trying. But good news, you have five friends on the boat with you. Now you have to swim with 15 pounds. What are the chances you can swim a half mile with 15 pounds? Some of you said zero. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think you could. I think it's possible now. So something interesting happens when we share the wealth of a business and get more people caring about it. You end up on shore and it's like a loaves and fishes thing. 150 pounds of gold shows up instead of 90. And that's how you grow a business, is by getting more people involved and caring about it. In our staff meetings, we review all the financials of our company. To everybody, because everybody's an owner. It's kind of fun. Okay. So, what to expect? Uh, covered a lot of different pieces here in evaluating a startup. I think the, the tough thing is to get in, thinking about what really matters. Uh, ideas end up being kind of cheap, right? And sometimes it comes down to much more about the execution. Uh, I'd like to tell you a story. Has anyone heard the story of the parable of the great sea captain? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so. There was once a great sea captain whose fame was known in all sorts of naval battles. It was kind of an amazing thing. What happened is, as the ship would prepare to go into battle, the captain would turn to his first mate, my first mate, and turn to the first mate and say, fetch me my red shirt. The captain would put on his red shirt, they'd go into battle, and they'd win. So the red shirt kind of had this mystique going about it. Well, the captain didn't want to tell anybody, but the whole reason the captain wore the red shirt or so his people didn't seem to believe. Well, one day, an armada of enemy ships was spotted on the horizon. And the captain turns over to his first mate. And the first mate's all excited because he knows what's going on. And he says, fetch me my brown pants. <laughs> Just like any good entrepreneur, right? Don't want to let him see you sweat. OK. So <laughs> sometimes that's what it comes down to with being an entrepreneur. Sometimes you just got to you know, bite the bullet as it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. I love that one though. It's so true that the parable of Gracie Captain is being an entrepreneur. I can't say that anyway. So we talk a lot about violent execution. And uh, this is a quote from Patton. More progress results from the violent execution of an imperfect plan than the perfection of a plan to violently execute. Too many times we get into this analysis paralysis, thinking through things over and over and over again. And uh, we're right now in the middle of one, uh, and we're working on this, this new one in the garage. And we're like, you know what? Let's just go see what works. So we're already talking. I mean, we don't even have, we, we've spent 100% of our capital on a domain. $2.99, I think it's like, believe it. it just happened to be available. It was kind of weird. And uh, you sit there and say, well, we haven't spent any money, and yet we're already out talking to potential customers and potential targets. We go through and collect information, try it real, get out and try it, see if it's going to work. Move fast. It's OK to be bad. It's OK to have mistakes. It's not okay to sit still and think about it forever. You're not going to get anywhere. So, final wrap up. If we think about uh, how we change the rules that the world has out there for you, it wants you to go out there and get the going rate. How do you get above the going rate? How do you change those rules? You got to rewrite them. You got to take some risks. You got to be informed. You got to have the information to be able to do that. And then we can rewrite those rules. <laughs> You have been weighed. You have been measured. And you absolutely have been found wanting. Welcome to the new world. God save you if it is right that he should do so. So, I'm a big advocate for being entrepreneurs. And I know not all of you are going to go off and start your own companies, and that's okay. But if you're an employee entrepreneur, you get a lot of the same benefits and take advantage of all those kind of things. I'm grateful for the chance to come and talk with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>